Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Rootless Containers in Gitpod. Um, my name is Christy Tan and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenters today, uh, Christian Weichel, Chief Architect at Gitpod, and Alvin Query, uh, Director of Kinfolk Labs at Kinvolk. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll, kick, I'll hand it over to Christian and Alvin to kick off today's presentation. Take it away. Thanks, Christy, for the intro. So welcome. Um, today we're going to talk about rootless containers in, in Gitpod. And to dive right in, we first have to talk about what is Gitpod. And Gitpod is an open source project that automates development environments. And you can think of it as a CI system that automates regular builds. Gitpod automates the provisioning of development environments for pretty much every developer. So it has um, ready to code dev environments, meaning all your tools are there, code is downloaded, um, code is compiled and, and you can ready to go. Uh, you can start working with a click of a button. And it does that behind the scenes by provisioning Kubernetes pods. So each workspace that you start within Gitpod is actually a Kubernetes pod. And we want those pods, those workspaces that you can start in Gitpod to feel pretty much like your local machine, except you get a new local machine for every ta every task you want to do. So there's no previous state that can impede what it is you're trying to do. And when we started out for a long time, one of the big differences between your local machine and what Gitpod would give you is what you could do within such a Gitpod workspace. For example, there was no sudo, meaning you couldn't install things um, after your workspace was running. You could only do that in the Docker image that, we, that you would bring to the workspace. And also there was no Docker. Um, which in a cloud native environment is a bit tricky. And so what we really wanted to have is we wanted to enable those two key uh, features where you could sort of have root in your workspace and be able to install things after the fact once it's running, but also where you would have Docker and do Docker build, Docker compose, etc. And this talk is pretty much about the technologies that made this possible and how we enabled this in Gitpod. So now this is possible. Now you can run Docker, you can do up git install. Um, you basically have root within your workspace. And the most naive way possible of doing this is by simply giving you all the privileges within the workspace container. You know, we could just run as root, so to speak. But the clear and obvious downside is that that would also mean that everyone inside their workspace would if, um, effectively be root on the node. They'd effectively have all the privileges they'd need to potentially escape the container and um, to have really a lot of privileges on a node that is shared with say 25 other users. So clearly this is not an option and we need some good way of isolating those workspace containers from each other but also to the node. And this is where Linux isolation tech comes in. And I'll hand over to Alban um, to talk about that. Thank you. Um, so there are different ways to um, isolate more of the pods from each other and from the host. Uh, one way is to think about uh, VM like container runtime. Uh, those are, for example, NABA containers, JVisor, Kata containers, Firecracker. And this this uh, technology to provide uh, improved isolation compared to what Linux containers are. Um, they work in different ways. For example, NAPA containers use unikernels. This means that for every new workload, uh, there will be a different unikernel built specifically for that workload. Uh, 
or there is JVisor. Um, what it does is uh, re-implement the Linux system called interface. Um, so it's very implemented in Go. So when your application um, make a system call, instead of talking to the Linux kernel, it talks to this interface, this application kernel. There are kata containers that um, build a lightweight virtual machines, and it's uh, compatible with several uh, hypervisors, for example, QMU or Firecrackers. Uh, those different VM technologies um, they provide more resolution, but they also give um, more limitation compared to normal Linux containers. They could be compatibility issues, compatibility issues or they could have a, a decreased performance, for example, with a network traffic or um, IO uh, file system access. Uh, what we want in general is to have um, higher density. That means to be able to put a lot of pods uh, on the same node uh, without uh, having to uh, mean that too much. So next slide. Um, there is an alternative approach, which is not to use VMs, but use uh, what is called user namespace. So uh, user namespace is a feature from the Linux kernel among other namespace, for example, net network namespace, uh, pin namespace, and so on. Uh, currently, that's a feature that is not uh, provided by Kubernetes. So Kubernetes works like you see on the picture on the left. Um, it has uh, uh, worker nodes, kubelet, and so on that don't use user namespace. Uh, what user namespace does is to isolate users. So that means the user root inside the container is not the same user root on the host. So that provides some isolations. Uh, there are different, way to, different ways to use user namespace in Kubernetes. Here I provide three different uh, explanation of uh, different way to use it. Uh, the, the second one from the left um, is called uh, CAP uh, 127. Uh, what it does is um, it uh, add a new field in the pod spec, a bit the same way that you have a host network in the pod spec to say whether or not you want to use um, a new network namespace in your pod. Uh, it adds a new field um, for user namespace. Um, so I represented it in red in this picture uh, where the user namespace will be located uh, in this architecture. Uh, so that's a, a cap. It means a Kubernetes announcement proposal. Uh, that's not something which is merged in Kubernetes yet. That's something uh, we work on that with uh, others in the community uh, to provide that. Uh, another way to use uh, user namespace is the next one, CAP2033. Uh, uh, it's so-called the rootless mode because it allows to run the different Kubernetes component uh, without being root. For example, it, you can run Kubernetes without being root. You can run the container runtime without being root. So in this way, you have a user namespace that uh, uh, go around all the um, components of Kubernetes. Uh, on the Last solution is the one uh, retained by uh, Gitpod, uh, where um, we don't touch uh, Kubernetes. So we can use uh, Kubernetes uh, upstream without modification. And inside the pod, inside the workload, uh, it makes use of user namespace. So it creates the user namespace at this time. Uh, in this way, it works on current Kubernetes without uh, patches. Thank you. So how do you how do you create a username space? And this is an example sort of walk through how, how to create such a thing. And uh, it starts with uh, the unshare syscall. Uh, there are other syscalls that can also do that, um, that create the, the username space itself. And then once you have that username space, you need to establish um, the UID and GID mapping that maps a user ID from within that namespace to a user ID outside of that namespace. And this happens to uh, happens by writing to files in the proc file system. And then lastly, you need some exec VE, so it's called to, to get a hold of the capabilities um, inside that user namespace. And you basically get uh, the full capability set at this point, including capsys admin, um, CapNet raw, etc. Um, you can try this yourself 
um, with this command. This lets you observe sort of the the things that the steps that happen um, to make this work. So unshare minus u minus uppercase u creates the username space minus r maps your current user, your current executing user to UID zero inside that namespace. And the S trace in front um, just traces what's happening. So this is all fine, except in a um, Kubernetes um, pod, we would need to give quite far reaching capabilities to make this work. So to write these uh, two files, you need cap sysadmin in the outer namespace. And because at this point, Kubernetes does not provide user namespaces yet, uh, this outer namespace would need to be the, the node as a whole. And we don't want to provide um, cap sysadmin um, for security reasons um, on the node inside the workspace. So we need to find a solution to that. And the way we, we built this within Gitpod is the root process that we start inside a container we call supervisor. And supervisor ring zero is sort of the thing that gets started. That's the command of, of the workspace um, container. And then it starts the username space as supervisor ring one. And once we have that, we make a gRPC call to a node daemon service that runs on the node that we call workspace daemon. And this service then has the capabilities on the machine to actually write those files. And we pass the PID of the process that identifies the user namespace we want to write this UID and GID mapping for. That's all nice, except now we have to do PID translation. And the reason for that is that containers in general are in essence, a collection of namespaces and other isolation tech, isolation tech. And one of those uh, namespaces is a PID namespace. This is why um, any process that you start um, sort of as the root of the container becomes PID1. And it's not the actual PID1 on the node, say system D or init or something like that. So the PID that we'll receive from supervisor ring one will not be the PID in the namespace that workspace daemon sees in the node namespace. So we need to do some translation here. So outside of the PID namespace of the container, this might be is something completely different. And in order to do this PID translation, there are a few ways how this could be done. There is no syscall yet that can just do this translation for you. Um, there are some tricks using Unix pipes, um, but also it's in the in the proc file system. So if we look at the status file of a process, we see that there is an NSPID entry, which lists all uh, PIDs in the children namespaces from the perspective from the process that's looking at this file. Because we know that the PID that we're looking for must be a child process of the container of the a workspace container, we can look at the children of that workspace container, look at their status files, and this way identify the correct PID. So now we can uh, create a username space and we can establish the PID mapping within this username space. Now we're left with a problem because this is working really well. If we look at the file system, we see that the UIDs now all of a sudden don't make sense anymore, at least at first glance. But thinking about it, this is exactly expected behavior because on the file system, we have some files that belong to actual proper UID zero. And we have some files that belong to a user that has a mapping within this user namespace. And the ones that actually belong to proper UID zero, they are shown as 65,534 in here because we don't have a mapping uh, that maps the user inside the namespace to UID zero outside. To illustrate that, what we would like to have is a file system that from within the user namespace looks like this. You have a whole bunch of files and folders that belong to UID zero, and you have some that belong to say some other user in this case, uh, 33333. And in this example, we have a UID mapping where UID, excuse me, UID zero inside the namespace 
is UID 10,000 outside of the namespace and UID 33333 inside the namespace is four, 33333. So basically just plus, uh, plus 10,000. So in order to get this view on the left from within the username space, we would need to have a file system on the node that actually looks like this, right? That actually has this UID shift implemented. But in reality, the file system that we need to do the shift for is the root file system of our container. And this root file system was put there by the snapshot of the container runtime. And it doesn't know about this UID shift and it also doesn't care. So in reality, the file system looks exactly like we would want it to look like from within the username space. So we need some process that uh, dynamically does this, UID or does this UID shift for us. And there are a few technologies that can do that. For example, there is Fuse over LayFS, which has the benefit that um, it can be used without any privileges outside of the username space. So you can use that completely from within the username space because Fuse can be mounted within user namespaces and um, it, the rest that's needed is a user name process. There is very little upfront cost. All you got to do is start a process but the run runtime cost is comparatively high because it has to go through user land. On the upside, it is not very platform specific. There is also um, overlayfs metacopy. Metacopy is a mode uh, in overlayfs where it just copies the uh, metadata to, um, to the upper deer. So what we could do is we could basically mount an overlayfs on top of the file system that we would like to shift and then basically do a change own on uh, onto that file system. And this is exactly where the upfront cost comes in. This change own is potentially very expensive if the root file system is large. The runtime cost is comparatively low. Um, in terms of platform specificity, overlayfs, to my knowledge, can only be mounted from within username spaces on Ubuntu because they have a non-upstream patch um, that takes the right box, so to speak, on, on OverlayFS. And lastly, speaking of Ubuntu, Ubuntu has support for a file system they call ShiftFS, which can do this UID shift um, at mount time, so to speak. It doesn't completely work from within the user namespace because you need something that they call a mark mount. And this you can only do with privileges in the outer namespace. But it, it has very little upfront cost. Um, all you need is a mount. Runtime cost is very low. It is um, quite fast and it runs entirely in kernel space, but it is very platform specific. It only works on Ubuntu. For Gitpod.io, which is the SaaS offering, the SaaS version of, uh, of Gitpod, we ended up going with ShiftFS because we have control over the environment that this runs in. And we deeply care about workspace startup time and performance. So now that we have the um, PID mapping established, we're using the same trick that we used to write to the PID and UID map to actually create this mark mount, this uh, privileged operation that we need to do that. So we make this make another gRPC call um, to the workspace daemon who then creates that mark mount for us. Once we have this mark mount, we can use it to mount the shifted file system uh, and then we do bind mounts to um, dev, proc, et cetera, other bits of the file system of the container, and then start supervisor ring two, which basically does a pivot route to this new file system. And this is how uh, inside ring two, you're A, inside this username space, but also um, you're looking at a shifted file system. So to you, all file system permissions and ownership looks correct. This is all nice, except we cannot just mount proc in this new for this new file system. But we want to do that because um, supervisor ring two also creates a PID namespace to sort of hide this mechanism away and also to prevent um, users of the workspace from uh, sort of escaping this new root file system. And we cannot mount proc because if we look at proc within that container, we see that there's a bunch of files that has a mask placed on top of it. So in the proc file system, there is a, 
Um, there are a bunch of files, a bunch of objects that are singletons within the kernel that are not namespaced. For example, um, proc kcore or sket debug, which might even leak information about other namespaces, hence other containers on the node. And so what Kubernetes and uh, or more specifically the uh, runtimes do, uh, container runtimes do, is that they mount masks on top of uh, the files and folders in proc in order to prevent uh, workloads from accessing those files. And in the kernel, there is a check um, that checks if such a mask is present. And if so, it prevents uh, users from mounting slash proc because that would essentially render those masks useless. In order to work around that and to never sort of offer an, an unmasked proc to, to the workspace container, we again rely on workspace daemon to make that mount for us. And the way that works is that we call out to workspace daemon with uh, the PID of the, excuse me, passing in the PID of the target PID namespace. We do that proc mount, establish the masks, and then move this entire mask proc mount into the mount namespace of, uh, P, um, of supervisor ring one of our new file system that we're creating. That's nice. So now we have root inside our workspace and it feels like root and things like apt-get are working, but Docker isn't working yet. And rootless Docker um, has, a, uh, has seen a lot of work, first and foremost by um, Akihiro Suda, um, who has worked relentlessly on um, things like uh, rootless kit and in general making Docker work as in, in a rootless mode. But also our friends from, from Kinfolk, Arban and his colleagues um, have done a lot of work in this space. So how do we make this work? And the, the key issue here is that Docker needs a, uh, needs a lot of capabilities with regards to networking. And we can provide those capabilities by, um, by wrapping Docker or the Docker daemon specifically in a network namespace. And to do that, we need to provide some networking into the outside world, so to speak. And for this, we use Slurp for Net and S, which is a user land mechanism to make, um, to make network namespaces or the connection, their connection to the outside world work uh, without needing privileges in the outer namespace. For proc mounts, because the container that run inside this or run in this Docker daemon, they will also need specific proc mounts because among other things, they're also PID namespaces. We use the same trick that we used to create the proc mount um, for the workspace container as a whole or for supervisor ring, uh, ring one. We basically call to workspace daemon and ask it to uh, mount proc for us. Now, this isn't quite as easy as it might sound because we need to sort of catch the right moment to do that. And we do this um, by sort of interjecting into run C. So as part of the OCI runtime spec, um, the container um, uh, orchestrator, so to speak, in this case, Docker or container D actually will provide, it will create the OCI runtime spec and in there it will have something like mount proc. And we uh, sit in between there, we modify the, uh, the OCI runtime spec and add ourselves as hook um, in the container lifecycle to actually do that proc mount. Okay, so much for how this looks like on paper. Let's have a look like uh, how this looks like in, in the real world. So this here is a, um, is a Gitpod workspace that runs in my um, runs in my browser. In a browser tab, obviously there's a full blown um, a container behind it. This is what we've just been talking about, and so in here I can do things like this. So I can just install um, uh, install new software, for example. But I can also uh, run uh, sudo docker up, and this will give me, um, we'll start the docker daemon with the process that I just described. And now I can run 
um, I can just run uh, Docker containers, right? So I just started Alpine. I can also do that. Um, Uh, with starting ports, and then Gitpod will realize that uh, this port is now served. Um, at the moment, there's nothing actually running on it. But if I um, if I start a web server in here, right, then I can access this service that now runs inside a Docker container in my workspace. So networking also works across this boundary. All right, oh, back to Aban. Thank you. Um, as you have seen, there are different um, way uh, to make it work. Um, uh, there were some difficulties that uh, it might be easier in the future, future to implement uh, such an architecture if we have uh, more things in the Linux kernel. And I will talk about a couple of that now. Uh, so one patch set that uh, is currently being reviewed is uh, IDMAT mount, and that's uh, something to uh, do uh, something to do something similar to ShiftFS, but um, instead of being a Ubuntu uh, patch, mm -hmm. it's something that is pushed upstream and is currently being reviewed. And once we have that, uh, I'm hoping it will be easier to uh, do this kind of shift FS operation. Um, that will be useful both for um, the root FS of the container to be able to have this uh, different ownership of file um, that will improve the performance both in uh, time and in uh, disk space. And another use case is for um, volumes. So we are, when you have in Kubernetes a uh, host uh, volume, uh, you do a bind mount from the host to the container uh, to be able to have this uh, shifted uh, ownership on this file. Um, so that's one thing I would like uh, to have on the next slide. There is um, another thing, so that's, um, Another feature that I'm enthusiastic about, it's called SecComp Notify. And it's a kind of a new SecComp architecture uh, with a SecComp agent. So what is the use case for that? Uh, as you have seen before, there is uh, this uh, interface, GRPC interface between the workspace and the demand outside that do some methods like uh, prepare user in space or mod proc. That on a privilege operation like mount. And um, I'm, um, I'm enthusiastic about uh, second notify because that will be able to provide the proper interface for this kind of thing. Um, so what uh, you will be able to do is to have the uh, container run the mount system call normally, and then uh, second uh, notify will intercept that and uh, send a message to the second agent that will run the mount system call on behalf of the container. Um, so on the next slide, I will explain a bit uh, that. Uh, at the top right, you see I have a second policy. That's where you define for each system calls if you want to allow or deny uh, the access to that system call. But with this second notify feature, you have an additional action that you can take called notify. And what it does, it will uh, say, Every time uh, the process in the container use that system call, it will defer uh, the decision to an external agent called the second agent. And then uh, this agent will be able to um, take decision or run the system call on behalf of the container. Uh, here, a uh, diagram uh, where you see at the top left, a run C when you use uh, run C or it's the same thing in Kubernetes when you start a pod. Uh, what happens internally, it will uh, uh, fork and exec a couple of time uh, to create this uh, child process, and then it will execute the second system call to, um, with this uh, notify feature, and then you get a file descriptor uh, to uh, be able to um, get the events uh, in this example, the mount system call. Um, 
and that file descriptor will be passed to the second page chart that will be able to uh, run actions on behalf of the container. So when the container in the end unmarked, um, the second page chart will do that. What it means is uh, it has the potential to make things simpler for uh, Gitpod or because it's, um, um, we could just use Docker inside the pod uh, normally, and when it run the mount system call, it will uh, uh, um, automatically call the second page to do that without having to implement this gRPC interface. Okay. And on the next slide, uh, um, put a summary of the different future um, technology in the Linux kernel or in general that uh, I think are interesting. Um, so uh, first, uh, in Kubernetes, uh, the support for user name space, there are two uh, Kubernetes announcement proposal that um, are for that, as I described before. And in rootless kit, if you go to this GitHub page about uh, rootless containers, you will find a lot of a uh, lot of repository, lots of projects uh, interesting, like uh, rootless kit, uh, user netis, which is about running Kubernetes without being root, uh, sleep for NetNS that Christian talked about, and uh, by by for NetNS, which is uh, the same thing, but uh, with more performance using the second notify. Uh, uh, so second notify in Kubernetes doesn't exist yet. That's something that is a work in progress. And I put here the uh, some different pull requests. Uh, so there is um, work in progress to make it available in RCI runtime spec and in RunC. Uh, in Sierra and on Kanman, the work is done already. And um, at Kinfark, we are working on this second pageant, which is a generic second pageant to uh, make it easy for you to use this kind of uh, this second notify feature. Um, thank you. That's, uh, Last slide. Christian, do you have a... Yeah, Thanks. so briefly to sum up, sum up um, Gitpod provides uh, dev environments that are built for the cloud, cloud and automatically provisioned. Uh, user namespaces are the key tech to um, make, uh, provide root within these workspaces. Um, and then thanks to all the amazing people that actually make this stuff work. Um, first and foremost, kinfolk. Um, also, um, Akahiro Suda and the, the community as a whole. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you both for a great presentation. Um, <clears throat> at this time, we're going to move into our Q&A segment. Um, so if you have a question for our presenters, feel free to submit it either through the chat or through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it doesn't look like we have anything submitted yet, but we'll give folks just a few seconds here to submit their questions. Okay, it looks like we might have a shy group among us today. <laughs> um, Alvin and Christian, um, I know at the beginning of your slide deck, you have your Twitter handles. Do you wanna go back to that slide just in case folks do think of questions later, place where they could reach you? Perfect, awesome. So you can see uh, both of their Twitter handles here on the uh, on the screen. So feel free to reach out with questions. I'm sure they would love to chat with you more about this cool um, thing called GitPod. Um, <clears throat> well, that'll do us do it for us today here at CNCF webinars. Um, thank you again, Alvin and Christian for this presentation and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, a reminder that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinars page. Uh, stay safe out there, continue to wear a mask and we'll talk soon. Bye. <laughs>